And as you already are aware, the Arctic's warming faster than the rest of the globe. What can be one of the coldest places on Earth is on fire. Gigantic infernos burning across Siberia on an unprecedented scale, a climate catastrophe. The wildfires burning in Russia now are bigger than all the fires raging across the globe combined. This the view as passengers fly into Yakutia, a region 3,000 miles from Moscow. If you look at the map of the North Atlantic, you will see the great neighbor to the west of Iceland, Greenland. And you will also notice that uh, it reaches further south than Iceland and much further north. And if you look at the latitudes and longitudes, you will also notice that the easternmost tip of Greenland is further east than Iceland. So it's quite a sort of all encompassing neighbor that we have to the west. And we are, of course, very concerned here in Iceland what will happen to Greenland in times of global warming. And one of the leading personalities in assessing the current sort of mass balance and the coming mass balance of, of Greenland is with us today, that is Jason Box, professor of glaciology at the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland in Copenhagen. He has made many expeditions to Greenland and continues to do so. He's on his way to Greenland from, from here. And uh, he has contributed chapters to IPCC reports and AMAP reports. And uh, he is an outspoken advocate for climate change risk management. So, Jason Box, the floor is yours. I'll be zooming out, and as you can see, talking about accelerations in the Arctic and global climate system. And I use system as a singular because the Arctic and global systems are interconnected. And what I'll present is from the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program. 14 authors, experts across the fields of the full Arctic system. So again, zooming out from Greenland to the Pan-Arctic and touching on Greenland, of course, because it's part of the Arctic system. And as you already are aware, the Arctic's warming faster than the rest of the globe, depending on what time interval you look at uh, that increasing departure from the global trend exceeds a factor of four. And taking the record back, surface instrumental records, what I showed before was era five. This is a hybrid of era five and the surface instrumental records, the difference illustrated by the shaded areas. Some things to point out is that relative to the 1900 to 1920 baseline in 2016, the Arctic was four degrees above that pre-industrial baseline. In the same year, 2016, global temperatures at the annual scale peaked at, at 1.3. And you'll notice the gray fit curves. There was a jump in the Arctic annual temperature after 2005. And that has been attributed in publications to an increase in the frequency of winter warm events. The incursions of heat and moisture into the Arctic through the North Atlantic, mainly in winter. Most of the Arctic warming is in the winter season. Yet this Arctic amplification is not just from loss of Arctic sea ice. It's also due to an increasing humidity of the atmosphere. The plank feedback that the the surface feels the lower atmosphere more, simply because of a, a warming and more humid atmosphere. And in the light part of the year, the darkening of not just the Arctic sea ice from more open water, more melt ponds, but of course the retreat of snow cover with the snow covered season lessening. So multiple processes contributing to this Arctic amplified warming. The map of the temperature change has the hot spots offshore, especially as you can see in, in the Barents Sea, where the marginal ice zone is retreating rapidly, and, and north of Eurasia, where sea ice is retreating and the, the storm track is also delivering more heat. And of course, there's more air-sea exchange of heat that is contributing to 
the delivery of heat from what used to be a, a capped ocean into the atmosphere. The apparent absence of trend north of Greenland is where the Arctic sea ice is very thick, so it's not all that surprising to see that. Maybe the blue spot might be a good indicator of, well, the era five data, they're not perfect. And at that scale uh, in Kane Basin between Greenland and Arctic Canada, perhaps that's an erroneous trend. But we did compare uh, with station records and we found an insignificant difference in the era five and the GIST temp instrumental records on Arctic islands. This is the snowfall change map. And who would like to tell us why do we have this decrease in snowfall over this uh, 43 year period? Well, then I'll, I'll, I'll say why that is. Uh, despite <laughs> the uh, First, I'll say there may be increasing snowfall in southeast Greenland or in the, in the hotspot region of Barents Sea. That's not entirely surprising. Given that the Arctic atmosphere is getting more humid, that's confirmed with uh, weather balloon data, satellite data. There is more moisture in the Arctic atmosphere. This decrease in snowfall is not because the atmosphere is drier, but because the threshold of zero Celsius is being crossed more often and there's more rainfall at the expense of snow. And it's not just that this uh, threshold is being crossed more often. Overall, across the Arctic, there is the total precipitation pattern of a wetter Arctic. And because there's some doubt in the era five accuracy of tr especially trends, I compared that with the uh, Global Precipitation Climatology Project data, they do share some of the same source data, but both data sets have an increase. And even just the gauge data do exhibit an increase in Arctic precipitation. So I find that pretty convincing, even though the magnitudes of, of these two data sets for the same area don't agree that well. So partly as a consequence of increasing precipitation is increase in Arctic river discharge. The Arctic Ocean is just 1% of global ocean volume, but receives 10% of global river discharge. So imagine that, that freshening perturbation of the Arctic oceanography, presumably a stabilizing effect of the exchange of the lower waters with the surface. Um, as you can see, the Eurasian sector has a much larger river contribution of the map rivers. And, uh, and I say this is a hyperactive hydrologic system because of not just increasing precipitation, river discharge, but in increasing humidity and, and, and cloud cover. So the overturning of mass within the system is, is increasing, and we see that on the Greenland ice sheet as well. Permafrost temperatures, we compiled available borehole temperatures, most of which are about 15 to 20 meters below the ground. And the coldest sites are warming the fastest. That's probably because there's less uh, latent heating of refreeze. And the rates of warming have increased. They mirror the increase in warming that really started after the 1980s. And if you were studying Arctic climate, say in the 90s, it really wasn't obvious yet that the climate was punching out of the noise. But by now, the Arctic climate has, has really started to exit its 20th century state. And impacts of permafrost degradation include accelerating coastal erosion. And that's partly added to by more wave action from sea ice decline. The abrupt thaw processes and flooding processes when thermokarst lakes form have a profound impact on ecosystems and the hydrology of the land surface. Curious features like palsas, which are ice cored dynamic freeze thaw growth features are strongly impacted. You can see in the foreground of the image, thaw slumps and exposed water and the abrupt thaw processes can deliver water and through latent heating, heat at many meters depth. 
in a matter of one season or a few seasons. So the conductive energy flux is not the only way that heating of permafrost at depth is occurring. And abrupt thaw processes include really conspicuous events like this, where in addition to abrupt thaw and hydrologic changes are increased emissions of greenhouse gases and increased sedimentation to the hydrologic systems. Fire, one of the most conspicuous actors, is increasing uh, because of a number of factors. Let's start with temperature increasing. The vapor pressure is nonlinear with, with temperature, so evapotranspiration increases nonlinearly resulting in a drier canopy, a drier surface. At the same time, uh, reduced snow cover well exposes that land surface to more drying process. And then more convective cloud development results in more lightning ignition of not just forest, but even tundra. And while we're all very concerned about the, the carbon source and the methane source from biomass burning, it's, it's actually eclipsed by the increase in methane from fugitive gas, from shale gas. The methane globally has been picking up again, and, and that is attributable to natural gas development. But fire, you've no doubt not missed the headlines out of Eurasia and, and Alaska. What can be one of the coldest places on Earth is on fire. Gigantic infernos burning across Siberia on an unprecedented scale, a climate catastrophe. The wildfires burning in Russia now are bigger than all the fires raging across the globe combined. This the view as passengers fly into Yakutia, a region 3,000 miles from Moscow. In terms of trends, some of the largest fires in, in Eurasia have been in the last few years, but fire is sporadic and, and so it can't just apply a, a linear fit to them. But the balance of evidence suggests that fire will increase as the climate continues warming. And not to be too anthropocentric, I wanted to just pause and let us think about the ecosystems and the plants and animals that don't have the same voice that we do to talk about and think about these catastrophic changes, because we are losing ecosystems in a catastrophic way. To land ice, we compiled Arctic land ice, that's the, the top curve. And in every 15 year period, the rates of sea level contribution were increasing. The Greenland rates in the green curve have been linear the, the last 15 years or so because of atmospheric circulation anomalies are really what drive extremes for Greenland melting. The increase in 2012 was largely a persistent NAO drawing warm air up West Greenland, and then the next year, 2013, it was the opposite pattern. And neighboring Svalbard was melting like crazy in 2013, so it's good to zoom out. And 2018 was actually the most imbalanced Greenland year in more than 30 years. And so you'll see a little downtick or stabilization in that pattern. And then 2019 was tied for record ice loss for Greenland, and that's the last data point there. The other Arctic land ice is on pace with, with Greenland, you can see, in the cumulative sea level contribution, driven mainly by Alaska, and that includes the Pacific sector of Alaska, so you might argue that's not entirely Arctic, and then Arctic Canada. And then I included Antarctica here because when you look at them on the same graph, the cumulative contribution, it, a, apart from the, the little downtick at the end of that curve, it, this suggests to me what we anticipate that Antarctica will or perhaps already is beginning to take over the Arctic as the leading source of global sea level rise. Now it gets more interesting. You can see the expected summer cooling from orbital changes. We were heading to another ice age and industrialization prevented us from going into that next ice age. And the pattern, many of you know that this has been called the hockey stick. And I'm surprised that I had to do this, that I'm just gonna graft on in the next slide, the next 100 years. And when you take this millennial perspective, this is when you'll recognize just how abrupt Arctic climate change is. Here's the next 100 years. 
So even in the most optimistic scenario, the Arctic will be warming three Celsius. The likely future is somewhere between those curves. And so clearly the Arctic has begun a, a catastrophe. The global climate system is in a catastrophic phase that we have no analog for. And at this level of CO2, this rough approximation suggests that we've committed already to more than 20 meters of sea level rise. So obviously it would help to remove a hell of a lot of CO2 from the atmosphere. And I don't hear that conversation very much because we're still adding 35 gigatons per year. As to the connection with the rest of the globe, I think it's simple meteorology when you heat the northern pole faster than the rest of the globe, that will slow down the Rossby wave, its eastward propagation, and there's mounting evidence of, of a more, uh, a higher wave numbers if you count the, the ups and downs. And not only higher wave numbers, but because of the slower eastward propagation of the Rossby wave, uh, more persistent weather patterns. And that means a lot of sunshine, which means drought, or a lot of clouds, which can mean uh, flooding conditions. This was at a time when in Washington, D.C., it was, it was year after year of these cold winters. And the politicians were ignoring that over on the West Coast, there was drought and perpetual sunshine from this uh, ridiculously resilient ridge. But these persistent waves are this, I say, the signature of Arctic climate change. And we can expect more extreme events. And I think that we are now crossing into the era of our attention focusing from the averages on the variances and the extremes. Uh, and we have plenty of examples of that. Starting with, just for example, if you remember the, the summer of 18, if you were in Europe, it was such a summer where families were having ice cream for dinner and they weren't complaining about the summer in Denmark, I must admit, but in Sweden, they had fires and their highest temperatures on record. And if you remember, Greenland in 18 was in balance. And this illustrates the, the, the wave, uh, persistent wave that led to this climate event. I was stunned about these 40 Celsius temperatures in Paris in the summer of 2019. And then this summer, Europe is in crisis economically. So I think it's finally starting to get everyone's attention that there is a, a link between environment and economy. To say something about the human impact, not just people desperately trying to get across the Mediterranean to a better economy. It's, it's not just climate that's doing this. It's a confluence of bad politics and non-sustainable development. And, and it's not just the Mediterranean. It's this migration pattern is occurring across uh, Central America as well. I'll end with an illustration a friend of mine wrote. And you can see he put the amber curve now a bit to the left of where I would put it. I would say that we're already in a phase of loss and damages and there is a very optimistic scenario where we get our science into policy and start to dig out of this hole but you know as, as good as I that our chances of avoiding a societal collapse depend very strongly on policy at a time that we are losing stability because of drought which is a much more immediate consequence of climate change than sea level rise sorry for depressing you that's, that's all that I have. <laughs>